At first glance, much of modern Mongolia still feels reminiscent of its ancestral past under the reign of Genghis Khan in the 13th century. Yet, today, an urban metropolis flourishes at the capital, Ulaanbaatar, and the young democracy has found a foothold in the global market. It was not always this way. For nearly 60 years, the country was a satellite state of the USSR, located as a buffer between Soviet Russia and Communist China. The peaceful shift to democracy in the early 1990s was made possible by the work of Sanja Surin Zorig and other Mongolian revolutionaries who took a stand for their beliefs. This movement showed that a peaceful transition after the fall of the Soviet Union was possible. Ultimately, Mongolia was ushered into a new age of democracy and independence from foreign interference. Mongolia's location in Central Asia has made it a prime location for international trade and interaction. From as early as the 5th century, the steppes of what is now Mongolia were central in the first Silk Road. By the late 1100s, the people of this region lived primarily in nomadic clans. These herders existed mostly in small familial units, with some trade and social interaction between clans, but little formal political connection. It was into this atmosphere that Temujin was born. In his lifetime, Temujin grew to become the man known today as Chinggis Khan. As great Khan of the Mongols, he unified the disparate clans of the steppe and led conquest throughout much of the Eurasian continent. From these beginnings, Mongolia played a major role in developing a stance on politics and society that included local self-rule and religious freedom. When Chinggis died in 1227, his empire was divided into individual khanates, which were given to his descendants. The empire began to decay and the fall of the Wan Dynasty led to Mongol submission to the Chinese Qing Dynasty that lasted for 200 years. In 1911, Bogd Khan took a stand in leading Mongolia to declare its independence from China. In 1919, China invaded the region. With Soviet assistance, the People's Revolution of 1921, led by Dom Din Suk Batar, succeeded in reaffirming Mongolian independence. This split also established Mongolia as the second country to adopt a socialist government and the first de facto Soviet satellite state. During this era, Mongolia adopted the Cyrillic alphabet, taught Russian as the main second language, and began efforts towards industrialization and urbanization. The government was modeled after that of Russia, with a single political party, the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party, MPRP, that held all the seats in the Hural, or legislative body. During this period, economic strife was widespread and the socialist leaders suppressed any and all dissent. Sanja Surin Zorig was born in 1962 into a world that had been shaped by these Soviet policies. The son of a Mongolian professor, Zorig attended Moscow State University where he studied scientific communism. During his tenure abroad, he was introduced to fledgling movements calling for an end to communist oppression through nonviolent protest. Upon his return to Mongolia, Zorig was slated to teach Marxist-Leninist philosophy. Instead, he brought back the resolution to take a stand against the MPRP and Soviet influence. Teaching in Mongolia, Zorig quickly gained the respect of his contemporaries. By the late 1980s, he had begun to hold secret meetings in which he and other potential revolutionaries discussed the possibility of political reformation and the overthrow of socialist rule. Really, we needed a new way of life because the old way was not working. Very clearly, it was understood, accepted by everybody. In mid-1989, Chinese students took a stand against their communist government. The Tiananmen Square protests sparked action across the communist world. By November, the Berlin Wall had fallen and the Velvet Revolution had begun in Czechoslovakia. Emboldened by these movements, Zorg and his fellow revolutionaries chose to stage their first protest on December 10, 1989. Meeting in Zukbatar Square, a group of about 200 called for the end of bureaucratic oppression and implementation of Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika, or economic restructuring, and glasnost, socio-political openness. Though Zorg did not speak at the event, he quieted the crowd so that speakers Sayagin Elbegdorj, Sukbatarin Amarsana, and Ardeni Batul could be heard. No effort was made to halt the protest. In the following days, the reformers met to create a list of demands. On December 17th, they staged another rally which ended in presentation of this petition to the leaders of the MPRP. This was the first time in Soviet history that a citizens group had taken a stand by formally presenting their demands to the government. Though the MPRP agreed to the demands, they proposed a five-year timeline. The reformers, dissatisfied with this delay, continued to build a base of support. On January 14, 1990, a group of nearly 1,000 protesters met on the public square in front of the Lenin Museum. 
This was the first of many weekly demonstrations that continued through February. On March 7th, a small group of protesters met again at Souk Batar Square, this time to hold a hunger strike. Across the country, other groups held rallies or strikes to show their support, and on March 8th, International Women's Day, the protests escalated as tens of thousands of citizens flooded the capital. Meanwhile, the Hural could not agree on a course of action for dealing with the protests. They did not wish to repeat events like those at Tiananmen Square, so they sought to avoid use of force at all costs. As democratically aligned demonstrations came to a head, on March 9, 1990, the Politburo, the Communist Policy Making Committee, elected to step down. This was a quiet abdication of power and occurred without any bloodshed on either side. In the following month, the Hural continued to convene. They began by rescinding Article 82 of the Constitution, which had dictated the single-party government. Soon, other parties were registering to nominate candidates. Over the months leading up to the election, reform candidates struggled to find support and connection to the population. They continued holding rallies to gain governmental attention. At one point, chaos came to a head, and it appeared that the peaceful stand may devolve into violence. Zorig, recognizing this possibility, climbed atop the shoulders of his comrades, pleading, If you support us, please sit down. These words in the image of Zorig at Sukhbatar Square became the symbols of Mongolia's peaceful stand for freedom. The effects of these actions were not immediately obvious. There was a coalition government that was formed, and then they had elections. So it resulted in the Communist Party uh, continuing to have authority. But by 1996, the Democratic Party held a majority in the Hural. For the first time in Mongolia's history, power was peacefully passed from party to party. The road to rule by the Democratic Party was rocky. Still relatively new to the political scene, they struggled to figure out how to run a government. By late 1998, they had already gone through two prime ministers and were in the process of electing a third. Various factions were unable to agree on which candidate to select. Finally, on October 2nd, compromise was found in Zorig. That same evening, upon his return home, Zorig was ambushed by two assailants and stabbed to death while his wife was held captive. The timing of this case had a profound impact on the country. As one member of parliament stated, this marked the end of the romantic phase of Mongolian democracy. In an attempt to preserve Zorig's legacy, his friends and family erected a statue just outside of Sukhbatar Square and started the Zorig Foundation shortly after his death. A number of political people from both sides of the aisle, both the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party and the Democratic Party came together and they decided to create a foundation in his honor to promote democracy and, and free market economy in Mongolia. Today, Mongolia has achieved many of the goals that its democratic revolutionaries sought to implement. With free elections held every four years, power is constantly shifting as the people see fit. In addition, Mongolia now participates in the global free market. Its abundance of natural resources such as coal, copper, and gold has made it a prime location for international investment. Many of those who played instrumental roles in the revolution have since found traction in Mongolia's government. Sanchasur and Oyun, Zorig's sister, served as foreign minister and as a member of the Hural. Sayagin Elbegdorj, who spoke at the first rally, served as prime minister and is the current president of Mongolia. Zorig's actions, too, are still upheld for their model of reformation in Mongolia and the power that can come from standing up for one's beliefs. Meanwhile, Mongolia remains sandwiched between two authoritarian nations, Russia and China. This puts the country in a uniquely precarious situation. Still, relations with Russia have improved greatly in the past decade, and China is now one of the greatest importers of Mongolian resources. In fact, the three countries recently began coordinated efforts toward unified economic activity. For nearly 300 years, Mongolia was subjected to foreign rule. First, under the Chinese Qing Dynasty, and then, as a Soviet satellite, Mongolia had not experienced real autonomy since the fall of the Mongol Empire. In 1989 and 1990, Mongolia's stand for democracy not only represented a movement away from Soviet oppression, but also became a revolution for true Mongolian independence. The work of Sanja Surin Zorig and other intellectuals helped rally citizens from across the country to unite for a common cause. By working together, the people of Mongolia were able to take a stand for their shared beliefs. As the country looks to move into a new age, Mongolia has reached out to other nations to determine how best to adopt democracy and capitalism. By establishing diplomatic ties across the Western world, but remaining staunchly independent of direct foreign influence, Mongolia will be able to stand for its own destiny in the years to come.